Joint Secretary East and South Africa, Ms. Nina Malhotra, and the Press Secretary to the President, Sri Ashok Malik. To begin with, the Joint Secretary will give you a readout on the visit to Equatorial Guinea, followed by a briefing on the visits to Swaziland and Zambia. I will then request the Press Secretary to give his own remarks, after which the floor will be open to any questions. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks once again for joining us this afternoon. Um, as OSDPR said, uh, President Sri Ramnath Govind will pay a state visit to Equatorial Guinea, Swaziland, and Zambia from 7th to 13th of April 2018. This is the third visit abroad by the President after resuming office, and also the third visit to Africa. The visit once again underscores the importance that is attached to Africa by our government. The visit is the first ever visit of head of state or head of government of India to Equatorial Guinea and Swaziland. And the presidential visit to Zambia is taking place after a gap of 29 years. The president will be accompanied by the first lady, <coughs> Minister of State for Road Transport, Highways and Shipping, Chemicals and Fertilizers, Sri Mansuk Mandavia, and four members of parliament. I shall begin with Equatorial Guinea. The visit to Equatorial Guinea will be from April 7th to 9th, 2018. This will be the first ever visit of a head of state from India to Equatorial Guinea, as I mentioned earlier. The president of uh, Equatorial Guinea, uh, President Obiang Mabasogo, had visited India for IFS3 summit in Delhi in October 2015. Recently, in March 2018, he visited Delhi once again for the ISS summit. In recent months, there have been several ministerial interaction. The foreign minister from EG, uh, he led a delegation to India to participate in the first India-Equatorial Guinea Joint Commission meeting held in New Delhi in October 2017. Before that, Minister of State for External Affairs, Sri M. J. Akbar, had visited uh, the country. As regards the program, Rashtrapati ji will arrive in Malabo on the evening of 7th of April 2018. On 8th April, he will address the parliament of the Equatorial Guinea. Thereafter, he is scheduled to hold talks with President Obiang, which will be followed by delegation level talks. Both the presidents are expected to review the entire gamut of relations. A banquet lunch will be hosted by President Obiang and Rashtrapati ji will later address the gathering at the reception for Indian community in the evening. A few lines about the country. Equatorial Guinea has joined the United Nations Security Council in January 2018, that is this year, as a non-permanent member for a two-year tenure. Rashtrapati ji will reiterate India's offer to work together with Equatorial Guinea during its UNSC tenure. He'll also seek support for early adoption of Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism, the CCIT, proposed by India at the United Nations. Equatorial Guinea, as you probably would know, has already extended support to the Indian candidature for permanent membership of the UNSC. India's relationship with the country is characterized by the strong partnership in the oil and gas sector. Equatorial Guinea is the fourth largest supplier of natural gas to India and is now keen to diversify its economy beyond oil and gas sector. During the visit, Government of India's decision to open a resident Indian mission in Malabo will also be announced. We are likely to sign at least three agreements and President will also make some announcements. Rashtrapati ji will depart for Swaziland on 9th of April 2018. Now we move to Swaziland. The visit again is the first ever HOS, HOG level visit from India. The King of Swaziland had visited India for the first time in 2015 for the India-Africa Forum Summit 3, and then in March 2017 last year as the chief guest for the CII Exim Bank Conclave. During the visit, he was hosted by our Rashtrapati ji. The uh, enhanced political engagement with this country is reflective of the desire of both the countries to deepen and widen political engagement. As regards the program during the visit, President will be received by the King of Swaziland and accorded a ceremonial reception on his arrival in Swaziland on 9th of April. He would have delegation level talks with the Swazi side and also a restricted meeting with the President. 
President Kovind and King Maswati III will jointly inaugurate the Information Technology Center located in the Royal Science and Technology Park. The center has been uh, set up with the assistance of Indian government. The other element of the visits include an address by the president at the Swazi parliament. The president is going to be the first head of state to address Swazi parliament. And he'll also call on the queen mother. His Excellency, the King of Swaziland, would also host an official banquet for the president. Regarding our engagement with Swaziland, we have assisted Swaziland through uh, two LOC projects, an IT center, which is part of the Royal Science and Technology Park, which is proposed to be inaugurated jointly for an LOC of about $20 million, and another project for improving maize productivity in that country for about $37 million. Both projects have been completed successfully and are deeply appreciated by the Swazi side. Some more proposals have been received from the Swazi side requesting fresh assistance, which are under examination. The Kingdom has also drafted a law for creating an export-oriented special economic zone centered around the RSTP, which is the Royal Science and Technology Park, which is already financed by us. And they are keen to make the legal framework attractive to Indian companies. Swaziland is among the last surviving absolute monarchies in the world and has been ruled by the same family for over 400 years. The country has good public infrastructure, good connectivity to important markets like South Africa, Mozambique, and Botswana, and enjoys membership of preferential trade groups and programs such as SADC, which is Southern African Development Community, COMESA, which is Common Market for East and Southern Africa, SACU, which is Southern African Customs Union, AGOA, which is African Growth and Opportunity Act, and the European EPA, which is Economic Partnership Agreement. Political environment is quite predictable with King as the sole arbiter of policy. And the country is strategically located next to South Africa and has good rail and road connectivity to all the neighboring countries. Even though it is technically landlocked, it is just two, three hours drive from both Durban and Maputo ports. Since it's a member of AGOA and EPA uh, with the EU, it therefore offers uh, therefore, the goods and services produced or processed in Swaziland, they enjoy duty and quota free access in a potentially massive market. So the country therefore has a tremendous potential to emerge as a safe commercial hub, hub for Indian companies. Moving on to Zambia. India-Zambia relations predate Zambia's independence. India's peaceful and non-violent freedom movement led by Mahatma Gandhi inspired many leaders in Africa, including the first president of Zambia, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, who also played a lead role in the liberation of neighboring countries in 1970s and 80s. Both the African National Congress of uh, South Africa and SWAPO of Namibia had their headquarters in Lusaka for many years. Zambia extended support to almost all the liberation movements in the region, that is Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, and South Africa. Zambia was the first country that Nelson Mandela visited after his release from jail. Zambia is a land-linked country and has uh, eight neighbors. It's surrounded by eight countries, and there are no cross-border tensions or conflicts. The country is among the very few countries in Africa that's, that has had democratic, peaceful transitions of power and no cross-border tensions. The first president, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, who's also sometimes referred to as Gandhi of Africa, he'd, he had visited India more than 10 times, beginning in 1957 as a freedom fighter, and thereafter visited several times, including on bilateral state visits, as well as for multilateral events. From India, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi visited thrice, 70s, 76, and in 80s. President V.V. Giri and Sanjeeva Reddy in 1974, in 1981, PM Rajiv Gandhi and President Venkat Raman visited in 1989. The current visit would be the first one after a gap of 29 years. As regards the program, a President would arrive in Lusaka uh, on 10th of April. Apart from the ceremonial aspects, President would have meetings with President Lungu and delegation level talks with the Zambian side. His program includes a meeting with Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, 
the first president who was also awarded Jawaharlal ne Nehru Award for International Understanding in 70s. And there would be a state banquet, an interaction with the Indian community, and the president would also address a business event jointly with President Lungu. Our bi bilateral relations are cordial and warm. India is described by Zambian leaders as all weather and time-tested friend. Zambia has consistently extended support to India on issues of interest to us, as well as for India's candidature in the, at the multilateral fora. Our bilateral trade has grown steadily. In 2016-17, bilateral trade touched nearly $1 billion. India primarily imports copper from Zambia. Zambia is the second largest producer of copper in the world and produces nearly 5% of the entire world copper production. India is also one of the largest investors in Zambia. We have investments nearly $5 million billion in Zambia, mostly in the mining sector. Important bilateral investments also include India's Zambia Bank, which, is compri which comprises of three public sector banks from India, which is Bank of India, Bank of Baroda, and Central Bank of India, and Government of Zambia. In addition, Konkla Copper Mines by Vedanta, Bharti Airtel, which is the largest player in Zambia's telecom sector, and now Bharat Ventures Limited, investing heavily in mining as well as in a thermal power plant. Tatas have invested in the real estate and have a five-star hotel, Taj Pamodsi. Zambia is also covered by a DF DFTP of India and enjoys all the benefits. India has provided considerable economic assistance to Zambia in the form of grants and credits. Zambia has been provided three lines of credit by India for in the recent past for the Itezi Tezi power project for $30 million, uh, establishment of health posts, uh, nearly 650, out of which 247 have been completed. And recently, an LOC has been approved for $40 million for agriculture mechanizations. Zambia also avails a large number of our ITEC program and ICCR scholarships. As regards defense cooperation, one of our closest linkages with armed forces of the African continents is with Zambia. The linkages date back to the pre-independence period when we sent a battalion of Sikh regiment in former northern Rhodesia, which was the precursor of Zambia. The linkage is strengthened after Zambia attained independence in 1964. There were years when nearly 40% of Zambian armed forces underwent training in various Indian defense institutions including several of Zambia's defense chiefs. At one time, almost the entire Zambian Air Force was trained by the Indian Air Force in every field. India also assisted with the setting up of Zambia Defense Forces Command and Staff College by sending an advisory team. Zambia has a large and vibrant Indian community. There are about 20, uh, 25,000 persons of Indian origin, and majority of them are from Gujarat state. In the past, two Indians have occupied government positions, namely Deepak Patel and Suresh Desai, who held cabinet-level positions. Indian community is generally very well established and doing, uh, contributing immensely to Zambian economy. Here again, during the visit, some agreements are likely to be signed and some announcements will also be made. Uh, we shall be briefing you during the visit regarding that. I think I shall stop here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, sir, over to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you know, this is the third state visit of President Covind since he took over as President of India in July last year. Uh, it is not by coincidence that all three visits have been to Africa. Uh, this reflects the importance in Indian foreign policy given to Africa by this government and uh, the country generally. It also reflects uh, President Coven's personal commitment to that relationship and uh, to the countries of Africa. Uh, in his uh, two previous visits uh, to Ethiopia and Djibouti and then to Madagascar and uh, uh, Mauritius, uh, President Coven uh, touched the Indian Ocean. This is the for the first time that he will be touching the Atlantic shores of uh, Africa. And in fact, his visit to Equatorial Guinea will constitute the furthest west he has gone as President of India. Uh, when President Covent took office, he was keen to, to visit countries where no Indian president or head of government had traveled previously. He has uh, made an effort to do this repeatedly. 
Djibouti, which was the first country he visited, uh, saw the first Indian presidential visit, as did Madagascar. In, on this trip, he is continuing that tradition uh, with Equatorial Guinea and Swaziland, as uh, my colleague said. Uh, he considers it a privilege to be visiting these countries and uh, uh, to, in a sense, playing a pioneering role with these visits. Uh, president Kovin the, is going to be the fourth Indian president to visit uh, Zambia, and uh, as uh, Nina said, the first in almost 30 years. He particularly looks forward to renewing one of India's strongest relationships in Africa with uh, Zambia, in addition to, of course, building on existing relations with Swaziland and Equatorial Guinea. Uh, he also looks forward to meeting President Kenneth Konda, who is uh, one of the statesmen of our times and a very respected figure. Uh, that's all I have to say. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, sir. The floor is now open for questions. Um, you know the rules. One person, one question. Rajiji. With Zambia, are you going to sign any new defense cooperation agreement? No, there's no defense cooperation agreement in the pipeline as of now. Mm -hmm. But are you going to expand defense relations with them? As I said, uh, we already have a very good uh, relations with Zambia, and uh, we had uh, contributed a great deal in the development of the defense forces. Um, our policy pertaining to Africa is uh, Africa-led and Africa-driven. I mean, keeping in mind the priorities of the African countries. If Zambia so desires, we shall definitely uh, assist them in uh, defense uh, forces uh, development. Any other questions? Elizabeth. I'm sorry, I think I've got the agreements all confused and mixed up. So basically, we have two agreements with Equatorial Guinea. And what about subsequent countries, Swaziland and uh, Zambia, in terms of number of agreements? Uh, see, normally, till the agreement is signed, you know, we, we take it as, a, as the agreement under process. So there's a likelihood of at least three agreements uh, in case of Equatorial Guinea. We may sign uh, two to three agreements in the subsequent two countries as well, which is uh, uh, Zambia as well as Swaziland. Uh, we shall be announcing, I think, uh, during the visit. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, you talked of uh, the presence of uh, Indians in these countries. Is there possibility of any uh, engagement with the Indian diaspora there with the president? Thank you. In all three countries, the president will be engaging with Indian diaspora groups. Uh, of course, in Swaziland, the diaspora is relatively small, but he will be engaging with diaspora groups in all three countries. Small clarification, actually. When will he be reaching uh, Zambia? He will be uh, landing, uh, you said, on 9th in Swaziland. And uh, when will he be reaching Zambia, in the last leg of on his On the 10th, 10th evening, 10th oh. in the afternoon, actually. And uh, he will be leaving on the, uh, returning on, on the 13th? Uh, yeah, 12th evening, he departs from Zambia, and he reaches in uh, Delhi on the 13th. 13th early morning. Do you have bilateral trade figures with Equatorial Guinea and Swaziland also? Uh, I have with uh, Zambia. Zambia, you told just now, but. Yeah, one billion, but the trade is heavily in favor of uh, Zambia because we import a lot of copper from there. Um, uh, in case of uh, Swaziland, the trade is uh, not very high. I can give you, because it's a small country. In fact, it's the s uh, second smallest country after Lesotho in Africa. And uh, uh, we usually, we buy a little bit of gold from uh, Swaziland. So let me just give you the correct uh, trade figure. Uh, 
a figure I have is about, yeah, um, $22.02 billion is their exports to India and their import is about uh, 39.56 million. So which is not very high, it's, uh, nearly 59 or so. Zambia, we have sizable, in fact, we have about one billion, and we have also, as I said, investments, sizable investments in that country, about five billion dollars. In fact, nearly 2.8 to 3 million in Kunklan copper mines itself, which is by Vedanta. Then in that India-Zambia bank, which I mentioned, we have, uh, our banks own nearly 60% of the equity, which is three banks, CBI, Bank of India, and uh, Bank of Baroda. Then we have, uh, you know, Taj, uh, Tata, so having investments in that country, the Navashiva uh, Ventures, which have also invested both in copper mines as well as in thermal power projects, and a, a huge number of middle-level Indian companies. So we have sizable investments in Zambia. In the case of Equatorial Guinea, while I don't have the numbers with me, uh, primarily uh, we import Roughly, we are importing roughly 800 million uh, amount of oil and gas mostly from Equatorial Guinea, and our export roughly amount 11 to 12 million only. Yeah, roughly. Imports from EG to India. Uh, EG is the fourth largest supplier of natural gas to India. West Africa actually in general is a, uh, is a very uh, good source of oil and gas for India. We source nearly 20% of our crude oil requirements from Angola and Nigeria and also a little bit from South Sudan and gas mostly from EG, Equatorial Guinea. We are looking uh, in the case of Equatorial Guinea uh, to help and support Equatorial Guinea's effort to uh, diversify its, its economic base from just oil and gas. Uh, we are looking at uh, agriculture, we are looking at, uh, uh, at uh, helping them survey for minerals on their mainland, uh, minerals in addition to, of course, uh, energy resources. Thank you. If there are no other questions, then this briefing is concluded. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir, for joining us.